Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our topic for today is the super empowered individual. This is a phenomenon of just very recent history where an ordinary individual could rise to power. Well, you might say this has been the case in, since time immemorial. That every once in a while, an ordinary person rises to power and uh, strongly influences history. Well, the situation is different because today there are more and more super empowered individuals than there have ever been in the past. If you look at the picture on the right, you see Donald Trump. Once again, rising to enormous power by hook and by crook, and even becoming the president of the United States. And when he was voted out of office, still remaining one of the most important political powers in the United States. <clears throat> well, in this world, the majority of the super empowered individuals are not interested in political power. In fact, many of them have more power than the presidents, the dictators, and the kings of the past. And our world is increasingly being dominated by super-empowered individuals. Think of what's going on in Russia with the oligarchs, so-called oligarchs. Well, it's not just Russia that has its oligarchs, Ukraine, was run by oligarchs in the United States. Super-empowered individuals very often tell the presidents what to do. So we're going to explore this fascinating new world of super-empowered individuals. On the left, you see the outline. You're going to see the uniquely American fascination with heroes. Think of Superman and now Superwoman and all of these cowboys riding off into the sunset, shooting up the place. Fascination with mafia, with drug cartels. These are the people who have wielded power. And the United States, with no firmly established aristocracy, no firmly established elite, super empowered individuals, the hero has always been part of our culture. Then we'll analyze some of the women and men of the past who have risen to power. Then the unique characteristic of the 21st century is the role played by modern technology. The very fact that I can record a PowerPoint, put it on, Zoom, transfer it to YouTube, I can be watched by millions. I really don't think I am, but people are. There are people who have risen to great power and wealth by using this new type of technology. And then who are the super empowered individuals that are today running the world? And then point five is panic in Washington, in Paris, in London, in Beijing, in Moscow, in Johannesburg, in Brasilia. What are the nation states, the countries of the world? How are they reacting to this brave new world of super empowered individuals? Well, it is one word, panic. All of these little countries which are on our maps so neatly outlined with black and in various colors, they are in literal panic as they see the nation state, the government, the country becoming increasingly irrelevant in this new world of globalization in which the super empowered individual is now supreme. So let's get started on our exploration of the super empowered individual and the 21st century.
Well, the Americans have always been fascinated with the superhero or just simply the hero. In the Wild West, it was the cowboy or the settler moving into the West, chopping down trees, killing off the Indians, driving out the Mexicans, uh, and building a continent. It was a man-eat-man -man world back then. If you look at the picture, you see the man and, uh, standing up on his wagon, shooting the Indians. And you do see the role of the women. She had to be strong enough to, to handle those four or maybe six horses dashing across the prairie, bullets and arrows going in every direction. These were the kinds of people who made America. Think of my own ancestors, my mother's family, coming over from Germany in the 1830s, getting a wagon, going across to the Midwest, chopping down trees, probably fighting off the Indians, building farms, and building towns. This was the American superhero. That's why we love cowboy movies. That's why we love gangster movies, because they are strong individuals who, since we don't have dukes and barons and aristocrats and kings and queens telling us what to do, what to do in the United States, it's very individualistic. We admire those who come from nowhere and rise to great power and influence. Thousands of books and movies have been made about the American Wild West and our superheroes. In fact, these were the people who made the American dream, the Lone Ranger, sort of an anonymous figure, riding around on his white horse of purity and saving the endangered damsel doing good, and then riding off high silver away to his next wonderful adventure. The Magnificent Seven, look at those guys. I mean, that is the dream of every young boy to ride off, make his mark on history, and become famous. The myth of the self-made man, and today, increasingly, the self-made woman has taken many forms. We think about um, Andrew Jackson, an orphan from Tennessee, bought some land, speculated, bought a bunch of slaves, became rich, became powerful, and ended up elbowing himself into the White House. The first American self made man. He was the first president from the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. He was a hillbilly, a mountaineer, a guy from Appalachia who made good. In fact, he was Donald Trump's role model. In fact, when you look at pictures of Donald Trump in the White House, you can always see on the wall, not George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or FDR, you're going to see Andrew Jackson the most corrupt president we ever had, the president who invented the term spoils of war, the term that means that when you win the war, it is up to you to gather the wealth from the war. The term he invented was spoils system. He was in the White House, his family, his friends looted the country for every penny they could grab. Another self-made man, John Jacob Astor, or more correctly, Johann Jakob Astor, from southern Germany, Protestant, came over with nothing, hardly spoke English, got into the fur trade, built Astor, city of Astor on the West Coast, invested his money on in real estate and became the richest man in the world when he died 
in 1848. The first great American fortune, according to the book. Well, of course, we remember these men. With his name, Astoria, Queens, City in Oregon, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. In fact, I was in London not long ago, and there's an Astor Hotel in London. One of his children ended up moving to London and once again strongly influenced British culture. The famous robber barons, as much as we hate them, as much as we denigrate them in the in modern history, everybody admires them and like to do like the Astors and the Jacksons, they plaster their name everywhere. John D. Rockefeller, Rockefeller Center, Andrew Carnegie, the Carnegie Libraries, Vanderbilt, very famous New York name. Hotels, streets, buildings, named after these self-made men. The type of men Americans love to admire. Andrew Carnegie, immigrant from Scotland, arrived penniless, ended up becoming the leader in the Pittsburgh steel industry. And we think of Carnegie Hall, the Carnegie Libraries, Carnegie Mellon University. Once again, we admire these ruthless robber barons. Even in religion, we admire the great hero. Well, Christians are sitting around expecting the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, returning, overthrow evil, inaugurate the millennium of happiness. In fact, in Brooklyn, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, the Rebbe of the Lubavitcher sect of Judaism, was proclaimed the Messiah. He was the one who was going to lead to the restoration of Orthodox Judaism. The great Messiah. In fact, people gather at his grave in Brooklyn expecting him to spring back to life and to continue his work of salvation among the Jews. Jesus was proclaimed the Messiah on Palm Sunday when he went into Jerusalem. He was going to lead the Jews to rise in revolt, slaughter the Romans, and make Israel a great empire from the Euphrates to the Nile, ruling over half of Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, the whole way up to Iraq. I mean, this is what the Jews wanted, their Messiah. And below that, a Messiah who I have met. This is Reverend Moon of the Unification movement, again, claiming to be the salvation of humanity, a new Garden of Eden, a new Adam and Eve had arrived, and he would save humanity. People flock to messianic movements. They adore great, powerful individuals. So in both economics, politics, and in religion, humans have always admired the great self-empowered, super-empowered individuals. Sweet Daddy Grace, another celebrity preacher, attracted hundreds of thousands of African Americans in the darkest days of the Depression, he was going to lead them to salvation. And the salvation that he was promising was not after you're dead and go to heaven, but look at the way he is dressed. He would lead them to prosperity here on earth. Joel Osteen, you can, you will become a winner. 
Jim Jones and the People's Temple lead them to South America, create a new Garden of Eden. And who is Guru Maharaj Ji? Another great religious leader promising salvation. And people flock to them by the millions. Well, sometimes these end up uh, going bad at Jonestown, where everybody ended up committing suicide or being murdered in one of the great tragedies of modern world religions. But still, uh, people, and especially Americans, flock to great charismatic, powerful people. And in New York, we don't hesitate to put our name on everything we can and celebrate our glory. Trump Tower, Lenox Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard, Astoria in New York City, a city of Astoria in Oregon, Rockefeller Center, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University. Here again, the mystique of America is you too can have your name plastered all over everything. You too can rise from obscurity and amass great power, whether it is religious power and wealth, economic, political, social, even Hollywood entertainment individuals can amass great power. So it is the admiration of the Superman. Obama is Superman. Hillary is Superwoman. Donald Trump is the Super Trump. These are the people who fascinate Americans. A country, as I said, with no established aristocracy. You too can rise to greatness and you too can spin out of control and become a disaster. Think of Bernie Madoff from nothing to super billionaire pulling the strings of finance only to have his empire collapse himself dead, half of his family committing suicide and millions of elderly people without a penny in their older years. But still we admire these people. Can't help but admiring Bernie Madoff. I mean, sleazy, conniving, thieving. I mean, he's almost as bad as Donald Trump in his evil manipulation of power. But yet we admire these kinds of people. Well, in the past, we have always had individuals who rose to power. Well, when son becomes a, a king or an emperor following his father, that's sort of okay. But when it is a nobody like Alexander the Great, who emerges from nowhere and becomes a, a great emperor, that's the type of person we admire. Augustus Caesar, the emperors of China. Well, we don't remember half of them, but we do remember those slaves or eunuchs or prisoners who managed to overthrow the emperor and establish a new dynasty. The Roman emperors were filled with fallen emperors, murdered emperors, generals and slaves, rising to great power. Attila the Hun merged from Asia, conquered Asia down to Vietnam and into the heart of Western Europe. As much as we hate him, we still can't help but admiring this kind of person. Some women have risen to power. Catherine the Great of Russia, 
uh, ordinary princess of an obscure state in Germany, ended up marrying the Emperor Paul of Russia. Well, she was ambitious. Within a couple of months, Paul was dead in his grave, and she was the great Catherine, empress of the Russian Empire. Golda Meir, a schoolteacher from Chicago, ended up going to Israel, becoming a great political leader and probably one of the most powerful women in history. Cleopatra, Victoria, the various heroes and heroines of Hinduism and other religions. There have been many great individuals in power, and those are the people we study and admire. Emperors, generals, dictators, Charlemagne, Zheng He, a eunuch, slave to the emperor of China, went off, explored the oceans of the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, explored the coast of Africa. His ship, the giant one we see in the picture, was the largest ship ever built in the ancient world. The little ones in front of it, those are the size of Christopher Columbus's little boats that he used to cross the Atlantic. Whether you love him or hate him, Joseph Stalin, who wasn't even Russian, he was from the Republic of Georgia, changed his name to Stalin after the German word for Stahl, which means steel. So this was Joseph the man of steel, responsible for the deaths of tens of millions. But yet he defeated Hitler and built his own Soviet empire. Well, the problem with these individuals in the modern world, as we are going to see, is this is a world of globalization. Money flows across borders. Something happens in one country and the economies of other countries collapse. Information flows across borders, internet. People from all over the world can view my YouTubes no matter where they are. In fact, I get emails from all over the world asking questions about some of my emails. So money, ideas, religions, the Mormons are well on their way to becoming a universal global religion. In fact, as I speak, there are more Mormons outside the United States than there are in the United States. So in this global world, the individual nation state, these little countries you see on the map, so neatly outlined in black, each one with a different color and its nice name and its capital city. What is a country like Britain in this global world where ideas, money, religions, economic industries, politics flow around the world, totally ignoring these lines? A titan of industry in real estate can live in one country, have citizenship in two or three other countries, and operate in half of the countries of the world. We live in a global world, and in this global world, the super-empowered individual has now become more important than the kings, the presidents, the dictators of these little, neatly outlined countries in the world. So what is going on in these first decades of the 21st century? Well, this is the age of modern technology. The inevitable, understanding the 12 technological forces that will shape our future. Once again, they are global. As Thomas Friedman argued in the world is 
what? Globalization is a reality. The world is no longer divided up into little neatly outlined countries. It is an open world. Millions of people migrate every year from one country to the other. Listen to Donald Trump screaming and yelling about the United States being flooded with Muslims and Chinese and Indians and Mexicans. Build that wall. Resist globalization. But yet, even him in the White House, he is a product of this global world. He is a super empowered individual. Tech trends in practice, the 25 technologies that are driving the fourth industrial revolution. This is a new industrial society, one that is dominated by robotics, by artificial intelligence, by computers, by internet, by education online communication online. Once again, as Thomas Friedman says, the age of the nation state, the country on the map is over. We are going to a new fourth age, and that is the age of a global world. Communications. Well, remember back in 1866, the telegraph, which was so phenomenal, who could telegraph a message from one part of the United States to the other, it would arrive immediately. And then the transatlantic cables linking United States and Canada with Great Britain. This was a phenomenal revolution in communication. But of course, it was limited to lines, underwater cables, or lines on telephone poles across the country. It was slow, it was cumbersome, but it inaugurated a revolution in communication. You no longer had to write a letter, get somebody with a horse to ride from New York to Boston to deliver the letter. Well, today, communication is instantaneous. Google, Every bit of information you could possibly want, go to the web and you will get any information you want. I'm leaving today for the ocean on Fire Island. I just checked what is the weather in Fire Island? What is the pro, uh, prediction for this weekend? The internet, emails, instantaneous communications. And as much as the individual country, like China or Russia, or United States or South Africa or other countries, want to control Google, control internet, every time the government clamps down in one corner, well, a new technology pops up and communications happen. You see people living in a grass hut in the middle of Africa sitting on a stool or around a fire while they're cooking their dinner, jabbering on a cell phone with their brother who is driving a taxi in New York City. This is a revolution in communications. And it is available to everybody. You can have a cell phone. You don't even need an expensive computer. You can go to the public library in New York and you can use the computer for free for an hour. Books are online, newspapers are online, and this is easily accessible. Finance, money flows around the world. The stock market goes up, stock market goes down. Something happens in the Congo in the middle of Africa that influenced the price of chocolate immediately, the price of hot chocolate at Starbucks goes up. The price of chocolate in a store goes down. 
There is a hurricane and the pineapple crops in Hawaii are destroyed. Well, the price of pineapples goes up within five minutes. Money flows from the Shanghai stock market to Hong Kong, to New York, to Paris, to Frankfurt in Germany, to London. Even new coins such as the Bitcoin are being invented so that the government can no longer control what is happening with the money. Until present, it was the country that controlled the money supply. American dollar, French franc, today the euro, the Russian ruble, Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, these were controlled by governments. Whereas now the Bitcoin is no longer controlled by the government. You can buy them, sell them, transfer them, and the government of the country has no idea what is going on. This is very good for black market, for money laundering, for drug cartels. They are totally free to shuttle their money around the world. ATMs are everywhere. In many countries that I travel to, you go to an ATM and it'll say, what kind of money do you want? Do you want euros? Do you want dollars? Do you want the reals of Brazil? Offshore banking. You can be a multi-billionaire in France, but you hide all of your money in some offshore bank account. And so even the governments don't know how much money you have, where the money is going. So finance today is finance in a flat world. Armies. For centuries, countries had armies. Now, every once in a while, somebody, a general very often in the army, would get power and would overthrow the king or the dictator or the president. But armies were usually associated with a country. Whereas today, money flows around the world. Culture flows around the world. Religions flow around the world. Well, in this day and age, anybody can get the resources to build their own army. Corporate warriors, the rise of the privatized military industry, where private armies and non-military organizations and individuals can start acting like armies. Think of ISIS taking over a big area in the world. It was an army, but it was not controlled by a government. It was controlled by a group of Muslim individuals. The JDL, the Jewish Defense League of Rabbi Meir Kahana, was one of these independent armies founded by a bunch of Jews. Here again, waging war killing Muslims in pa Palestine and Israel, murdering people in New York City, a private Jewish army not associated with any country. Future of war, power, technology, and American world dominance in the 21st century. Well, looking into the future, what is going to control the armies of the future. Think of Al-Qaeda declaring war on the United States. First time an individual and a private organization declared war against another country. We all know about 9-11. The Oath Keepers and other private military organizations in the United States we all saw that in January 6, where they attempted to overthrow the government, storm the Capitol, lynch Nancy Pelosi and the vice president, and put Donald Trump back in power. I often wonder what he thought. If these people take over, if they put him in power, 
and then they don't trust him anymore, they can also remove him from power. They could go to war against the American army. I come from rural Pennsylvania where private militias come to train. This is a growing threat to the nation state and it is a growing reality. Religious empowerment with new technology, you have religious groups that for centuries nobody paid much attention to, now are becoming empowered. In the middle, you see the Taliban. Here again, a religious movement moving from country to country, from the Sudan to Afghanistan, having branches around the world. Once again, a small religious group that through the use of modern technology has become a major international organization. The Lubavitchers, they even refer to them as the Rebbe's army. These were... Orthodox Jews who have joined together and are now a world power. They are a powerful influence in the United States, powerful influence in Russia, powerful influence in Israel, very often opposing the policies of the state of Israel. But even the state of Israel cannot destroy the power of the Lubavitchers. In the upper right, you see that big, beautiful building. That is the Temple of Solomon, built in São Paulo, in Brazil. The Igreja Universal de Reino de Dios. The Universal Church of the Reign of God, founded by a Brazilian preacher, now worldwide, super wealthy, building churches all over the world. Here again, using modern technology, modern travel, modern finance, modern communication, even a preacher in the jungles of Brazil can become a super empowered preacher. Buddhists have started using the internet, modernizing their religious outreach, keeping a tiny Buddhist community in some state, some city and up in North Dakota in direct contact with the community back home. Even during COVID, so many churches were forced to have their religious services on Zoom, forming virtual congregations. Donald Trump managed to get the support of the evangelical Christians, and he could just as easily lose the power. But the evangelical Christians are tech savvy. They know how to communicate, how to use money, how to use political influence to make the evangelical Christians the most powerful religious force in the United States. And we won't even talk about Mexico and Brazil and countries in Africa where the evangelicals are now one of the most, if not the most important religious organization. West Bank settlers, once again, with modern technology, modern armaments, Jews from all over the world migrate to Israel, go to the West Bank. And these militant West Bank settlers have their own militias, their own plans. They want to take over a Palestinian town. They move in, and even the government can't stop them. They receive billions of dollars every year from wealthy American Jews, and they are expanding their presence in East Jerusalem, in Israel as a whole, and especially the West Bank, out of control in the eyes of the Israeli government and even the American government. 
global migration, a fact of the 21st century. Angela Merkel recently accepted one million new immigrants into Germany with just signing a document. I was in Paris and London last summer. I mean, you get the impression that London is Londonistan. The French higher neighborhoods are now taken over by Africans. I'm Muslims. This is a reality, the age of migration. And not everybody migrates on ships or walks through the wall from Mexico to the United States. In this day and age, migration can be on an airplane where people will come to the United States as students or as visitors, simply overstay their visa and end up becoming a part of the new society. The picture at the top in the middle shows me working with the Vietnamese refugees fleeing Vietnam. Uh, this was in Southeast Asia. I worked there for a summer as the, part of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. So in these first decades of the 21st century, people are on the move. You get people who are born in one country, go to school in another, work in another, roam around the world. When I was in Dubai not long ago, the woman at the hotel lobby was from the Philippines. She had worked a couple of years in the hotel industry in Brazil, in New York, and she was now in Dubai. She had accumulated three or four passports, spoke five or six languages, her husband was not Filipino. He was from Saudi Arabia. I believe the children grew up speaking Tagalog from the Philippines, English, Arabic, and were citizens of the world. Once again, even Donald Trump's wall could not stop the arrival of millions of refugees from all over the world coming across the border into the United States. His ban Muslim immigration did very little to stop the phenomenal growth of the Muslim population of the United States, both through conversion to Islam and immigration. <clears throat> well, these migration is just one of the problems confronting the modern nation state. You go to France and you really wonder how many people are French. All these new immigrants coming in. What does it mean to be French? This is a big issue the French are um, complaining about now because they're finding that so many of the new immigrants said, okay, I'll learn French because it's a useful language, but I don't consider myself French. I consider myself a European. I consider myself a citizen of the world. And with global warming, with wars, with earthquakes, with all the other problems we have in the world today, migration is only going to increase. Huge areas of Africa are drying out. The Sahara Desert is expanding, forcing millions of nomads and farmers to flee their dying countries in the Sahel and make their way across the Caribbean to, the, to Europe or even further away south, uh, to South America and then to the United States. Another reality of the 21st century uh, is the reality of global pandemics. Whether it was AIDS emerging in Africa and spreading around the world, or whether it was COVID-19 emerging in uh, Wuhan in China and spreading around the world, these new pandemics 
books are a feature of the 21st century. It's unbelievable that the nation state of the United States with the trillions of dollars we spend on medical care ended up being the country the least able to deal with COVID-19. In fact, today, COVID remains one of the major causes of death in the United States. And these new plagues are going to get worse in the future. Monkeypox seems to be under control, but now in New York, we're having an, an epidemic of polio. And these diseases mutate. Ebola coming out of Africa again, a form of Ebola that nobody can cure. It is resistant to all the antibiotics. Forms of malaria tuberculosis that no drug can control. Well, this new world, migration, flat world, everything flowing, everything in flux that Thomas Friedman so carefully described in his books, Longitude and Attitudes, and the world is flat, has given rise to a whole new group of individuals, super empowered individuals. They have access to trillions of dollars, communications, they can mobilize millions of migrants and immigrants. They can have bases in five or six different countries and the countries of the world are literally powerless to control them. In this area of globalization, Thomas Friedman wrote, there are three balances of power. The United States as a superpower, global finance, money flowing around the world, and super empowered individuals who are able to employ the latest technology to influence the other two, to influence, if not control, global finance and even the United States. What happened on September 11 was a result of one super empowered and angry individual. There again, Osama bin Laden, the prototype of a super empowered individual declaring war against another country. First time in history that an individual has declared war against a country. In the past, it has been other countries that declared war against each other. Whereas here for the first time you had a super empowered individual who declared war against the United States and accomplished what Hitler and Stalin could not, the bombing of mainland United States. Another superpowered individual, Bill Gates of Microsoft, an American, became the richest man. Sometimes he loses the status, sometimes he gets it back. His wealth is in here, it was listed at the time at $86 billion. Well, there, he had so much power that there was a um, uh, humorous, phony newspaper report, which said that Microsoft was going to buy the federal government in Washington. Because, many people said, Microsoft was efficient, it was well run, it was profitable, it was goal oriented, which made it a candidate to replace the American government, saying that a superpowered individual can have more power, more influence, be more efficient, profit oriented, goal oriented, than most of the governments of the United States. We had Donald Trump who was trying to close the United States off from the rest of the world. Now we have a new president who is open to the world, dragging the world into this 
crazy Ukraine war because Biden was so desperate to get Ukraine into NATO, build American military bases all over the Ukraine, that it gave really Russia and Putin no choice but to respond to this vicious aggression. So here again, in this day and age, most companies are better run, more profitable and efficient than most of the countries of the world. Think of the corruption of the Mexican and Brazilian governments, the chaos that is in half of the countries of Africa. Maybe Microsoft should take over ruling these little countries and turn them into just a department of Microsoft. Google, Page, Brin, and Dichai. Again, we see the globalization, one American, one Russian, and one Indian forming Google. Or the company is Alphabet, Google Capital, Google Ventures, Nest, Calico, with 2019 assets of $276 billion. Here again, who can control Google? Governments try to censor it, but yet people always find a way of getting around it and getting the information. Governments are desperate. They've been able to censor newspapers and magazines, which were print. But in modern technology, with Google and with internet, the countries are no longer able to control the flow of information in this flat world. George Soros, a Hungarian, American, Jew, amassed huge financial power and used his power not just in philanthropic and charitable ventures, giving money to a hospital or a school or to cure a disease, but he has turned himself into a spokesperson and a major supporter of what he calls an open society, progressive ideals. A liberation, women's rights, the right to education, opposition to dictators, supporter of democracy. Here again, when he established the Central European University, he was spreading his ideals to the masses, first in Hungary, and then Hungary, when it started becoming a much more conservative society, ended up expelling the university, literally going to war to silence George Soros. Well, George Soros simply moved his university, I believe it's currently in Prague, um, to continue his work. And here again, even the Hungarian government could not control George Soros. And George Soros... When he sees something he doesn't like, he says it. And he has the financial resources, the access to modern technology to make himself into one of the economic, intellectual, and moral spokespersons in the world that even countries cannot control. He's been kicked out of countries like Russia and China, I believe, because they oppose his open society ideology. Elon Musk, South African American, once again showing the influence of migration from South Africa, came to the United States, put down roots, but considers himself very much a citizen of the world, amassing huge amounts of money, billionaire CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, and he is shaping our future, according to Ashley Vance. A self-made billionaire, visionary entrepreneur. Here again, he's not just 
making money and living in a big house and enjoying it. He is shaping the future. Electric automobiles, exploration of space, coming up with some of the most phenomenal ideas where suddenly you're having an individual who is building rockets and possibly even build bases on the moon, investigate planets, explore planets, maybe even start building cities on other planets and exploring the stars. This is an individual who is doing this. This is not a government anymore. The American government, if it wants to build a base on the moon or the Russians or the Chinese or the Israelis, it would be for military purposes to dominate the earth. With a huge military complex on the moon, one rocket could take out a major city or destroy a entire country. Whereas here now, we have no longer countries who are even militarizing themselves, but we have an individual who is taking over many of the functions that have until present been dominated by countries. So you sort of wonder how authoritarian countries like China or, or Russia or Iran view an individual crowding in and accomplishing what the countries themselves can't do. Osama bin Laden, establishing his own army, declared war on America. His speeches are broadcast around the world, even if countries tried to censor him. They called these organizations, terrorist organizations, tried to stamp them out. But people like bin Laden had so much power, master of modern technology. Sort of strange when you see a very devout Muslim wearing his garb and his beard with women wearing their veils. Very conservative on one hand, but ultra modern in his use of modern technology, fundraising establishing his army, and then destroying the two iconic buildings in New York, attacking the Pentagon, and even almost bombing the Capitol building. The three pillars of American power, New York finance, Washington government, and Washington military. Here again, the power that he had amassed to accomplish this is absolutely phenomenal. <clears throat> Oprah Winfrey, entertainment power, ordinary African-American woman with a very um, unfavorable family situation in the past, ended up amassing a fortune in billions. They call her the Queen of Talk. Net worth estimated, last time I checked, $3.5 billion. Here again, her book, Lessons for Life-Changing Success. You too can become a multi-billionaire. And her influence is phenomenal. Her famous book club list, where you can be sure that every book she recommended on her show, the sales went up and you can be sure she was getting a good cut. Look at the way she's dressed. Every picture, a completely different outfit. When Oprah would show up on a program, the dress she was wearing was an instant success around the world. When she put on weight and started wearing large size clothing, every fat woman on the face of the earth wanted to wear the latest Ofra dress for fat women. When she got thin, she cultivated the thin crowd. As she gets older, it is the older women who look to her how to do their hair, what kind of jewelry to wear, 
what kind of makeup to wear. Every picture of her is different. That is marketing. Just the picture flashed across the internet, flashed across the Google, flashed across the television screen or a YouTube video, and it is millions of dollars in her pocket. Once again, a face, a name, which is recognized around the world, a powerful woman, a super empowered woman. And dear Macado, an ordinary kid from Brazil, growing up, establishing his own religious empire, the great universal of the reign of God. Here we see him, his book, Nada a Perda, Nothing to Lose. On the cover of Forbes' billionaire list. In the middle at the top, that is his reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon in Sao Paulo. Below that, that's me standing at the front door. I mean, using every means of modern technology. Look at all those people lined up to go into his massive temple. He claims it's even bigger than the Temple of Solomon. Missionaries all over the world, billions of dollars in financial resources. In fact, the president of Brazil is a member of his church, as are other world leaders. They listen to him. He brings his millions of members to vote for whoever he decides. Again, super empowered religious leader. Gautam Madani, 152 billion from India, beginning with ports, various industrial um, um, ventures, import, export, now a global economic power. If he has a steel mill, one in England, one in Germany, one in Russia, one in India, and one in the United States, the steel industry goes down, he has to decide which steel mill am I going to close? Well, of course, no country wants a steel mill to close, but it's no longer Berlin or Washington or New Delhi or Moscow that make those decisions. It is the super empowered industrialist who makes these decisions. Jack Ma in China, once again, his Alibaba, trillions of dollars in power, in influence. Once again, a ordinary Chinese guy who is now an international, a global force. Uh, even though he is based in China, but still Alibaba is present around the world. <clears throat> Lakshmi Niwas Mattel, the steel man from India, buying steel plants around the world, the largest steel producer in the world. Here again, steel is central to the economy. If there is a crisis, who gets it? Who is going to control the, the uh, mines where you get the iron ore, get the oil or the coal to run the mills? Which plant is going to close when the economy is bad? Which is going to stay open? Which is going to grow? Here again, a super empowered individual. Well, of course, Washington, D.C., Paris, Moscow, Beijing, Brasilia, Johannesburg, all of these capitals of great countries are seeing their power 
gradually draining away. In this global world, this flat world, these capitals of these great countries are finding themselves less and less able to influence world events. Alan Rugman's The End of Globalization, Grave New World, The End of Globalization, The Return of History by Stephen D. King. The governments of the world do not welcome this age of globalization, this age of a flat world, and especially this age of super empowered individuals who can stand up to the presidents, the dictators, the kings, the generals of the countries of the world. So the war, these countries have literally gone to war to try to end this age of globalization. That's what was behind Donald Trump's baseball hat. Make America great again. Cut it off from the rest of the world. Uh, global finance, global immigration, global ideas. Return to the American Christian roots. Get rid of Muslims and Blacks and Jews. Make America great again as it was back in the 1960s and before that back to World War II, end the age of globalization. So now we are in a war time. Here are the giant ships which transport products around the world, are the giant banks which finance the world uh, globalization. Are the countries of the world going to sink these ships? Are they going to shut down the banks? Are they going to censor the internet and Google and build those walls that Donald Trump likes so much? So in these second decade of the 21st century, we are in a state of war. On one hand, Thomas Friedman, still believes that globalization is the wave of the future. On the other hand, people like Donald Trump believe that we should go back to traditional nationalism. In fact, in Europe, they just had the elections in Sweden and in Italy and together with Poland and Hungary and a growing movement in France and England and Germany, a return to nationalism, make Britain great again, make Germany great again, stop this wave of globalization. So we are caught in the middle of a great war, a great struggle over who is going to dominate the 21st century. Super empowered individuals, the forces of globalization, or the nation state, going back to the age of nationalism, which began with the unification of Spain in 1492, go back to the walls around each individual country. This is the struggle of the 21st century. Donald Trump, definitely make America great again. But Joseph Biden is globalization, be part of the new world. President Xi and China, on one hand, make China great again, but yet he firmly believes that China can control this globalized world by expanding Chinese global influence. So here again, what is going to be the role of the nation state in this new globalized world? Will they wither away, as Thomas Friedman prophesied? Or will they manage to keep firm control of the world, as President Xi advocates? 
or should the United States withdraw within its walls and go back in history to a time when we were white Anglo-Saxon Christian country? In Brazil, under Bolsonaro, it is beef, Bible, and bullets. Make Brazil great again. In India, make India Hindu again. Get rid of all these Muslims, and Christians, and Jews, and Jains, and Sikhs, and make India Hindu again. Nationalism in Russia. The rise and reign of Vladimir Putin, back to the Russian Orthodox Church, back to the roots of Russia, make Russia great again. So three countries which are trying to resist globalization, or at least keep a tight control on it, not going to give up their national power to these forces of nationalism. So it's an exciting time to be a historian, to be alive, and to see what is going on in this crazy new millennium. And how is this going to affect the workers? As people move around the world, we're having global working class. Places like Dubai and Kuwait and the other Persian Gulf countries. In some of these countries, 90% of the population of the country is not even a citizen, doesn't even have the rights of citizenships. They are Indians, Pakistanis, Indonesians, Brazilians, Chinese, Americans, Germans who go there. They work for a while, they make some money, and then they move on somewhere else textile workers in South Asia, work for a while in a textile factory there and then move to China or move someplace else. Well, this is another force of globalization as people wander around the world, what is gonna happen to them? Well, I'm perfectly happy being a child of the age of globalization. My BA was done in the United States, Gannon University. My first MA, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. My second MA at Harvard University. My PhD from the University of Geneva. Taught a year in Moscow, a year in Budapest, a semester in Vienna, a semester in Prague, lectured in Mexico, traveled all over the world as an academic. My YouTube videos are on all all viewed all over the world. My online classes, I have students from all over the world. It's crazy when I have a class, I have to have a class today at 6 p.m. New York time. Well, it's the middle of the night for my students in China. I don't know what time it is for my students in Africa or in Germany, but this is a global world, and I'm a great member of it. Well, how all of this battle between the states and globalization, between super empowered individuals and the traditional political economic leaders is going to affect the world is a open question. As factories move around the world, as super empowered industrialists shift their factories from one place to the other, they go to a place where labor is cheap. So you have child labor, you have women's labor. If a factory shuts down, the economy goes into a decline around the world, what's gonna happen to all of these workers in the factory, agricultural workers who live day to day. So the human cost of this battle between resurgent nationalism and globalization, between the super empowered individual and the traditional leaders of the world is having a very powerful effect on the ordinary citizen. When you think of a, my friend in Philippines, from the Philippines who worked in the hotel, 
uh, in um, uh, Dubai. I asked her once, I said, well, what are you going to do for retirement? I said, are you saving money? Well, she said, I send money back to help my family and this, this, and this. But Social Security is still controlled by national governments. Labor unions, labor organizations are still regulated by national governments. So <clears throat> how all of this is going to affect the ordinary citizen is another major question of the 21st century. <clears throat> the inability of countries to control labor these days. Factory closes in Mexico, everybody migrates to the United States. There was an earthquake in the Philippines or Pakistan, millions of workers go to the Middle East. Poverty in one country or disease can result in the virtual destruction of a country. So are we in the age of the end of the nation state? Here again, ask Donald Trump, President Xi, Putin, Bolsonaro, and you will see what's going to happen in the future. So our exploration of one aspect of the world of the 21st century, the superpowered individual, is an extremely important part of our history and of the future. So if you have a question, you can just send me an email at ronaldb712018 at gmail.com, uh, and I will get back to you as quickly as I can. There's me on the right in Rio de Janeiro. See the statue of Jesus behind us. Uh, once again, Brazil is one of those countries which is aggressively dealing with globalization and nationalism and ruled by a newly self-empowered individual, a super-empowered individual. So as we look into the future, it's a big question of what is going to happen as we go forward. Multi-billion dollar and very important question of the future. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you have found this interesting and I hope to see you at some time in the near future for another exciting lecture by Dr. Ronald Brown. Thank you very much, signing off and goodbye to everybody. <laughs>